This Week in Startups is brought to you by Dashlane, the leading password manager that safely stores and autofills all of your passwords, logins, payment information, and more, streamlining your web browsing experience while keeping your digital identity secure. Head to dashlane.com slash twist to get 10% off a premium subscription. Gainsight PX, the all-in-one solution for product managers. You worked hard on your product, make sure your users actually use it with Gainsight PX's adoption driving tools and powerful analytics. Try Gainsight PX for free today at gainsight.com slash twist. And monday.com. Monday.com not only helps teams manage work and meet deadlines, but also builds a culture of transparency to work better together. Start your 14-day free trial by going to monday.com slash twist. Then use promo code TWIST to get 10% off a paid account. Upcoming launch events. Get your free founder pass or purchase a VIP ticket for Launch Scale in San Francisco, October 7th and 8th at launchscale.net slash tickets. Apply for the next Launch Accelerator cohort. Applications are due September 2nd. Learn more and apply at launchaccelerator.co. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. I've got an amazing guest on the program. I should say back on the program because he first appeared on this program back in 2014. Uh, His name is Jeff Lawson. He's got a company called Twilio. You know it because all the developers and startups out there use Twilio uh, for their messaging, whether it's SMS messaging or even email now since they bought the company SendGrid for $2 billion back in October of 2018. I think this is your third time on the podcast. And since that time, things have gone really well. Welcome back to the program, Jeff. Thank you, Jason. It's great to be back. Yeah. Um, you IPO'd. Congratulations. True. Thank we'll talk you. talk about that. But I think the most interesting thing is you just crossed a billion dollars in revenue. Forget about billion dollars as valuation, which is the value of the enterprise. A billion dollars in actual revenue. When did Twilio start? And then when did you cross the 1 million mark in yearly revenue? Just to yeah, start to benchmark it. So we started the company at the very beginning of 2008. So 2008, myself, John, Evan, all three of us developers, and we had this idea. We said, you know, from my experience and all the companies that I had started prior, so I had started my first company when I was still in college. Then I was the first CTO of StubHub. Then I was one of the, um, uh, or started a bricks and mortar retailer actually doing extreme sporting goods of all things. Wow. Then I was one of the first product managers at Amazon Web Services. And when I left Amazon, was thinking about what I wanted to start next because I knew I wanted to start my next thing. And I realized that at every single one of those companies, there were really two things in common, right? First was the fact that we were using the power of software mm to build a better product and a better customer experience than anything that existed uh, to date in those industries. And even though like my startups that I had done before were very different from each other. My first company was an academic content company for college students. My second company was you know live event tickets, concerts, sporting events, yeah. StubHub. And then my third company was bricks and mortar for skateboarding and snowboarding and surfing. Like These businesses could not have been more different from each other yet. And every single one of them, we were using the power of software to build a better company and a better customer experience. And to me, that always meant, well, you listen to customers, you go out and build something, you put it out there in front of the customers, you get feedback, and then you keep iterating your way towards a better and better and better product and a Hmm. better customer experience. And the job of a software developer and a software-minded company is never done. You're always listening to customers and hearing how you can create a better product. And so that iterative spirit of software was key to every company that I had started prior. So take StubHub, for example. We went from the first line of code written to launch in six weeks. Wow. Right. That's like agile. Like that to me is like, this is what it's all about. Uh, But then the other common thread among all those companies was that you needed communications in order to build a great relationship with your customer. Right. And every time we ran into these ideas, we'd say, oh, well, yeah, if a customer calls us, let's like, we, we can you know, give them this information or oh, let's reach out to customers when this happens, when their package ships, when their cars, right, whatever it is. And every time we said, oh, yeah, that's an amazing idea. But I'm a software developer, like making mm. a phone ring, like having some voltage appear on a phone line somewhere in the world, like that's magic. I have no yeah. idea how that works. Yeah. And so we turned to the companies that seemed like they did know. We turned to carriers or like, you know, Cisco and say, how do we do this? And every time it was the same answer. It was like, hey, we can help you with that. You know, first thing, we're going to roll out a bunch of copper wire from a carrier to your data center. Then we're going to rack up a bunch of like telco hardware. Then you're going to buy a whole software stack that's on top of it. And then we need to integrate it all. And then we need to integrate it with your systems and build the thing you have 
have. And so we're going to bring in this army of professional services. And that'll take two years and take three, $3 million, right? Sign here. We'll get started. And every time I was like, wait a minute, hold on a second. First of all, millions of dollars to get started. I'm like, yeah. Makes no sense. I don't have that budget. But yeah. let's say I did. You know what's more offensive than the money was the time. Yeah, it's brutal. This, this idea that like, so I have this idea and I will have to wait two, three years before customers are ever able to tell me if we're on the right track, if yeah. this experience is any good. Oh, and then they're going to tell us a bunch of feedback and tell us what we really should have built. Yeah. And it'll be another two years and $2 million <laughs> before we get that built. I'm like, this is the opposite of software. Right. And so we started Twilio beginning of 2008 with this idea of saying, how can we bring software, or how can we bring communications into the era of software? Hmm. And under the belief that the future of communications was not going to be about all those physical wires and, and servers and windowless buildings, but rather the future of how we as human beings actually make use of this technology, it's going to be about the software. Yeah. And who's going to build that? The software developers of the world. People like me who in their company saw ways to communicate with customers that would be better and just needed this in our toolkit. And so that's where we started. And so yeah. uh, 2008, we did um, uh, a fairly agile process, right? We talked to a lot of customers before we even wrote a line of code, um, pitched the idea. Then we built a prototype. When you talk to customers, what's, how does that go? Like, how do you pick uh, the customers and what do you ask them? It's an well, interesting so this, thing that I think a lot of start. it's an interesting moment that I think a lot of startups skip. They don't talk to customers, they just build something they think customers like. Well, what we did in uh, in those days, actually, of all, and Twilio wasn't the only idea I was working on. Actually, at the time, there was a few ideas I was testing out with customers and trying to figure. Oh, out. Oh, really? Yeah. One what were the them, other ones? Uh, uh, two of them, they've actually both been built now. One oh. successfully, one unsuccessfully. Not by me, by other yeah. people. Uh, the first idea I was working on was uh, essentially Dropbox, uh, but I got one thing wrong. Huh. I said the value proposition here is backup. Yeah. And I talked to a lot of customers about like backup and what they want it, and nobody gets excited about backup. No, it's like a chore. And so the thing like Drew got right, yeah. it's like the same technical solution, yeah. except the value proposition is sharing. Yeah. Something people need to do right now. As they opposed to- document they're backup. attaching. Yeah. Backup is like, I'll think about that after I lose my files. Well, and the weird thing about backup is you get no value out of it. And, and yeah, like in the in the best scenario, you never get value out of the product. Yeah, it's like it's flood like insurance. insurance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. right. <laughs> and so, no, who gets excited about like insurance yeah. products? Like nobody. Sorry, insurers of the world. But um, and so I went to customers, and I got no energy in response. So I was like, okay, I guess it's a bad idea, and I moved on. Mm, interesting. And then, right. So the, the defining the right problem is like half the battle, right? Yeah, and also it's sometimes you explain to customers what you plan on building, and they don't understand it or don't actually even know their own behavior. Like, I guess there's that famous Henry Ford quote, like if people, if I asked people what they wanted, they wouldn't have said the car, they would have said like a faster horse or something like that. Uh, what was the other idea? That so the other out? one was a BitTorrent based distributed cable system. Oh my God, that's brilliant. Actually, that's what Travis was building with Red Swoosh, if you remember. So I you know. wanted to do peer to peer. Peer to peer. So you, you capture the radio waves, right, from yeah. TV signals, and then you could tune into anyone else's station anywhere in the world. Oh, okay. But the reason why I decided not to pursue this, which ended up being true, is that I just said it would be sued out of existence. Yes. And somebody did this. Uh, they did. Aero, they were, Aero, 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 something like that. Yeah, yeah. It was in New York. And what yep. they would do is they would put a computer on a card for you in a server rack somewhere. Then that would be your specific antenna to you. So they were just hosting technically your antenna. Mm -hmm. Yep. Then your antenna could be programmed to then save your files, and that would be your files. And if you taped the Warriors game and I wanted to do it, I had to tape it as well. So they would have to manage, instead of having one file for a million people, they'd have to have a million antennas for a million people, and it still got shut down and sued yeah. out of existence. Well, I looked at this one. I was like, first of all, this is just this is one of those things as an entrepreneur. You're like, well, if I really want to go give the middle finger to the establishment, this is a great way to do it. Yeah. But it's probably not going to be a great business. But the thing that really made me feel like, yeah, this is not how I want to spend my life, is I talked to customers, and I explained the how this thing would work and all that. Yeah. And I got basically a yawn. I was like, uh. And the funny thing is whenever I would pitch ideas to customers, here's how I would do it. Like I go to people who just seem like they would be the target customer of the idea, whether that idea was the cable thing, yeah. uh, whether Drop it was box. the backup thing yeah. or whether it was Twilio. I would just pick people who seemed like they would be in the target and I would describe to them, I would say, you know, I'm working on this idea and what it would let you do is this, right? And what it let you do is like stream a TV station from New York or whatever, you know, or whatever, you, whatever it is you wanted to do. And 
And I look for the people's reaction. And obviously the pitch has to be pretty you know, yeah. decent, but let's assume I've got a decent pitch. And the reaction from, from customers is like, most of the time what you get is like, a, oh yeah, that's a, uh, yeah. Okay. How about, uh, how about the Mets? Yeah. You know, and it's like, it's like awkward and they're like, they try to change the conversation yeah. and like, you're like, okay, well, I guess, you know, it's, it's not sticking in their head. It's not piquing their interest. Okay. And you do that enough times and you, you keep end up talking about the Mets. You realize this yeah. probably isn't a great idea, but then sometimes you get a different reaction. So when I was Twilio, I'd, I'd find developers, right? And I said, mm. Hey, I'm working on this idea where you have this API you could call and you could make a phone ring, for example, and then you could playback audio or, or, or playback text or record the audio or bridge people together into a phone call and do all these magical things or, you know, send a text message. And a funny thing happened when I talked to developers. You know, at first I'd explain the idea and then they'd say, oh yeah, oh, yeah. how about the Mets, right? Mm. And I'd be like, oh, okay, I guess it's yeah. a bad idea. But then a funny thing happened almost every time. Like about a minute later, like conversation moved on and I'd be like, yeah, oh, yeah. okay, I all guess, right. you know, I guess I got another dud here, right? And about a minute later they would say, Hey, you know, I got a question for you. That phone thing you were talking about, could I like call my customer when their package ships and let them know that, the, that their package ship from ah. my e-commerce website? And I said, yes, 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 you could. So the inception was there and, and it just took a little while start to start turning. Right, you, the use and, case. And, every, and I would say, yeah, I, yes, you can. Oh, interesting. Ah. And what I saw was they started matching the pattern mm -hmm. of things they had wanted to do as a developer in the past, but always assumed they couldn't. Right. So they just written off these ideas. That's not what I do. I'm not a telco person. I'm a software developer. So that's just out of the realm of things I do. And when I would pitch this, it took a minute, but they would start connecting it of like, Oh, wait a minute. What if I was that person? Mm. What if I was someone who's able to make phones ring and do all this magical stuff with communications? Oh, yeah, I have been having these ideas my whole career that I've just put aside and said I can't do. And then they would say, oh, wow. Yeah. Can I try it out? Let me know when I can try it out. And mm -hmm. so we started building and we had this like alpha version, like it all ran on one EC2 instance at one point in like yeah. March of 2008. And all those developers I talked to, I sent them an email. We created an account for them yeah. on this, you know, this thing. And I said, hey, remember that idea I pitched you about? Well, actually try it out. Yeah. And I just send them some very simple API docs and an API key. And I think there was no console. They couldn't log in or anything. All they could do was call the API. And they started building. And we wow. were, of course, watching, what, what, are they using it? Incredible. Who's hitting it? And we talked to them, yeah, what are you building? And I remember some of, one of them, one of those early, early developers built something that got on Lifehacker oh, in like oh. June of 2008. And yeah. the thing was like really, you know, it was janky. It, like this thing yeah. was, we took it down every night to like- And then all of a sudden 10,000 people engaged Yes. You. <laughs> Crazy. But, but, let me ask but you this. that gave us the courage to say, you know what? I think we're onto something. When did you hit a $1 million run rate? What year was it when you hit that? What would that be? Like 80K a if month? If I remember correctly. 90K a month? Yeah, we you launched, had to, yeah. We launched in uh, November of 2008. Yeah. Uh, 2009, if I remember correctly, we did about 200K of revenue for the year. Okay. Uh, 2010, huh. we did about 2 million in revenue. So okay. somewhere in there, we somewhere hit that Somewhere in that 2009. And I can tell you probably approximately where it was actually. It was probably in about October or November of 2009, about mm. a year after launch, yeah. uh, because I was trying to raise our Series A starting earlier that year. And I remember I pitched Union Square Ventures. So I pitched Fred, Wilson. Fred and Albert and, yep. and Brad. Smart cats. And, and, you know, they were intrigued. I remember Fred saw the, de I did the demo because I would live yeah. code a thing in front of the investors. And Fred was like, God, that's really cool. You, you distilled all of telecom down to five APIs. That's amazing. But they still weren't sure that we understood how to, the go-to-market was going to yeah. work and all that. And so they said no, you know, you know as, as investors do. And I just started unsolicited sending to Albert every month uh, the revenue, ah. the chart. Every month I just sent him- it's Chart bait. It's VC bait. Chart bait, yeah, all I right. guess. When we get back from this quick commercial, I want to talk about- what seems to be insurmountable, which is 10xing and then 10xing and then 10xing. A million to 10, 10 to 100, and 100 to a billion. This is scaling at a level that very few people have ever achieved, certainly not in this under a decade lifespan that Twilio's had. When we get back, I want you to explain to me how you did it, how you did that 1,000x fold in revenue that you just passed, I think this past quarter as a public company, a billion dollars in revenue when we get back on This Week in Startups. 
the average adult has 130 online accounts. That's 130 passwords. That's 130 chances for you to get hacked because you're doing stupid things because you're trying to save time. Like you use the same password over and over again. You know that you do it. I'm, I know you do it. You shouldn't do it. Well, nobody can remember all these passwords and it's so dangerous for you to be reusing your password. You need Dashlane. I know a lot of you are using it already. So this is for the other half who haven't figured out how to keep their lives safe and secure. You will remember all your passwords nice and easy, but they will auto generate those nice complex ones, and all of your information is stored and encrypted locally on your device, not on their servers, not somewhere it's gonna get hacked, but on your devices. And you can secure your documents and Dashlane not only does all this password stuff, not only your document locker, but it's also now added a built-in VPN, a virtual private network, so you can browse safely. I do this because let me tell you something, you start putting those passwords in, even if they're strong, and you do it in a cafe or at a hotel or in an airport, guess what? Bing, bang, boom, you're gonna get hacked. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to dashlane.com slash twist and get 10% off a premium subscription. And here's how easy it is. Look, CMO Press signs up, installs the browser plugin, and then he adds all his passwords for social accounts and he never has to remember them again. He can add his personal info, if he wants to keep his passport info, bank wire info, all that credit card info in there. And it's safe, it's encrypted. D-A-S-H-L-A-N-E dot com. Okay, dashlane.com slash twist. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, we're very lucky to have Jeff Lawson for his third appearance on This Week in Startups. He was on episode 308, episode 495, and here we are on episode number, well, it's 900 something. We don't know when we're wow. gonna actually do this, but we're gonna hit 1,000 this fall. Talk Crazy. about scaling. Talk about scaling, 1,000, and you went 1,000x. We went 1,000x uh, ourselves from one podcast to 1,000. When you got to that million, you had to be thinking, okay, I'm onto something. It's growing nicely. You were growing, what, 20% month over month, something like that? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, it feels pretty good. Did you ever conceive of this billion-dollar revenue number? When did you start to realize this was kind of a hockey stick happening? Well, you know, it never was exactly like a hockey stick, right? Because right. it was sort of every month for 10 years just kind of growing the yeah. revenue, growing the customer base. So some consumer businesses, you see that point of inflection where it just yeah. goes nuts, right? Especially with network effects. But in B2B or, or business to developer, like we are, like it is a little more, you win every customer. But as you do that, you start to get the reputation of like, oh, this mm. is a winning company. If you use this, it'll make you better. It'll make you stronger as a company or as a developer. Ah. And so you do gain momentum behind you. But it is always about, you know, you always focus on your next customer and focus on your next great product and listening to your mm. customers and making every single one of those customers successful mm. and evangelizing you. And that is how you build the business. And so I remember, you know, we always talk about order of magnitude accomplishments. So every time we cross an order of magnitude yeah. accomplishment, like 1 million, yeah. 10 million, 100 million. Billion, like those are the things that we celebrate because it obviously gets harder and harder to achieve yeah, those does. things. Yeah. And that makes the importance of it all the more. And, you know, I just remember thinking, like, I remember being extraordinarily excited, like the first day we launched, November 20th, 2008, we launched that morning. We had, you know, the TechCrunch story landed. You know, Evan, John, and I, we all three founders, we're sitting in like a coffee shop in the mission and like reading the TechCrunch story. We, true story, uh, we found a bug on the website with uh, like the, the story was going to land at noon, 1158. We found a bug, we fixed it, and we we're like rolling a new deploy wow. out to production, racing the clock for the noon story launch. And uh, that afternoon, we were driving down the 101. I think there was some startup event we were going yeah. to, and my co founders in the back seat refreshing our intranet saying, Oh, they're paying us. Yeah. They're putting in their credit cards. They trust us. Oh my God, for the first dollars that we were getting, right. let alone the first million or 10 million. But you know, every time we sort of look up, you, what you need to do as an entrepreneur is appreciate where you've gotten to and appreciate the team and all the hard work that goes into getting to where you are today. Right. But as the CEO or the entrepreneur, you need to be looking up ahead yeah. and saying, this is where we need to go. And always rally the troops from where you need to go. And one of the things that I always think about, like as much as we can look at how much we've accomplished and feel great about whether it's the 1 million number or the 10 million number or the 100 million number or now the billion number, yeah. pat yourself on the back, say thank you. We're, we're, we, we, feel, uh, we feel blessed. We feel uh, uh, proud. Mm. But we've only just started. Mm. And in a market as big as ours, communications. This is a trillion dollar market, Jason. Right. 
you cannot take that for granted. And you can't say, wow, we're really big. You can't get complacent and say, oh, wow, you know, we've won because we have truly only started. So when we went public in 2016, you know, one of the things I stole from Jeff Bezos at Amazon was day one. Yeah. I love that sentiment. And that is how Explain I Explain to people what that means and, and what it means to you and how you replicate that or live it. You know, it's like every day of building the company and every day of life, right? If you'd wake up and you say, this is, this is day one of my opportunity. Hmm. And you can say that as a, as a person, as an individual, you can yeah. say it as a company, that whatever we've achieved to date has just gotten us to the point where we get to wake up and say, this is day one of our next big opportunity. Yeah. That's what this means. Hmm. And so, you know, people often ask, oh, when's it going to be day two? Uh, and you say, like, well, you know, never, right? Because yeah. day one is a mindset. It's not literally a, you know, 24 hour period of the day. Right. And so it's a mindset. Do you wake up feeling like whatever we've gotten to at this point, this is just the precursor. This is just the stage, the launch pad for what we need to do in the next phase. Right. And to me, that's what day one is always about, always waking up with that day one mindset. Yeah. And so that was our, like the t-shirts we printed at the IPO said day one. Yeah. And I always drill that in. We just, you know, our, we just uh, did our earnings a couple of weeks ago where we announced our first uh, quarterly uh, billion dollar run rate uh, milestone. So order of magnitude achievement. That's incredible. Um, three, and of course- Just to let that sink in. That's like two or $3 million a day. Hey, let that sink in for a second. And if it's two or three million dollars a day, it's a hundred thousand dollars an hour. If it's a hundred thousand dollars an hour, it's about two thousand dollars a minute. That's what you're making now. And just think about how hard it was at Twilio to get a two thousand dollar a month client. But at the end of the day, it is just I mean, it's mind all, blowing. All dude. of those all those stats and you are, you're yeah. faster on the revenue breakdown calculations than I am. But it's, uh, to me, it's like you can sit and be and say, wow, all that. And you can be nostalgic or you can say like, yes, but what's the true size of this opportunity? Yeah. And what do we have to do next? Like, let's not take any of that for granted. Yeah. What do we need to do next to make our customers even what more successful? What percentage of the way you are, are? Are you there? Like, what do you think? If you, if you look at this and say, hey, it's day one, you think you're 1% or 10% of the way to what the market size could be in the opportunity? You said it's a trillion in communications, but there's a lot of different things. There's people's cell phone bills, whatever. What, what do B2B you think? B2B communications. Oh, B2B did you know, communications. Did yeah. you know that of all IT, IT budgets are about $2.4 uh, uh, trillion. Okay. 40% of all IT spending is on communications. So the routers, the Ethernet, the and ISDN lines, the T1s, everything, fiber lines. Yep. All, all spend. And so as I look at it, you know, some of the market, like hard lines, whatever, mm -hmm. like, you know, that's not what Twilio is going to do. But for the most part, other than the most physical elements of the network, what in that set story should not be software? Mm -hmm. What part of that story would not be better if it was um, running in software, running in the cloud at cloud scale with cloud operational excellence and having the flexibility of software and the creative ability of the developers of the world to improve that infrastructure every day. Yeah. And like, so to me, I look at that, that is the true opportunity. And so how big is it? I think the market um, is gonna get reconfigured. Mm. And I think segments of the market that seemed clear before, like, oh, you had the connectivity and then you had the, the hardware that it plugs yeah. into, you have the modem and the line and the carrier. The router and, like, and the... This stuff all collapses into a service offering that doesn't have those distinction anymore. Yeah, it's all been attracted away, right? It's... Think about what happened in SaaS. Yeah. Right, where it used to be, okay, well, I have to buy my data center. Yeah. Then I have to go rack up my servers yeah, and buy my switches. Yeah, the operating system set up, Ethernet get your sysadmin cables, in what's there. the market for Ethernet cables, right? Yeah. And, and, like, and then I have to install switches, the software and yeah. buy the disks and then yeah. the backup solutions and all. And all that stuff is now obviated yeah. by the fact that you can just pay one monthly fee to a cool. SaaS company and get the benefit that you were looking for out of all of that infrastructure jump straight to the benefit. Yeah. And we have the opportunity to do the same thing in communications, but that's not all. Mm. Because our most recent part of our offering, right, we started out, we did voice and then we did SMS and then we added Facebook Messenger mm. and WhatsApp and ch uh, programmable chat and programmable video. And then we added Alexa and Google Home. And like, so all the channels of communication we have on our platform now, uh, and then SendGrid with email, right? Mm. But then we started talking to customers and saying, how are you using this? Because when you think about it, when you're a developer platform, the fact that developers Developers are using their time to build on top of you, and their companies are spending their money either to use our platform or to pay those developers to spend their time to build those yeah. things, means there's something that is yet unbuilt in the world, a problem that is unsolved yeah, that exciting. they're trying to solve. Yeah. And as a platform, we now have 160,000 customers and over 6 million developers on our platform. We have this visibility into the big unsolved problems that are out there. When we see these patterns continually uh -huh. emerging, 
we go to our customers and we ask them, you know, why are you building here? Why don't you just go buy a solution? What's motivating you to actually build something here? Huh. And what they reveal to us is the big unsolved problems. And we ask them, did you want to build this? Like if we had built something in this arena that solved that problem for you, that empowered you, the yeah. developer, but made your job easier and faster, would you have wanted us to do that? And the answer is usually yes. Ah. So for example, take the contact center space. We had all these customers building contact centers on top of Twilio. Yep. You know, ING Bank, Home Depot, a lot of these companies were building their next generation contact centers using our raw APIs. Right. And we go in and we talk to them and say, why are you doing that? Yeah. There's so many. You could go on prem, you could buy all sorts of contact you centers. Got Zendesk, you got yeah, there's a lot Salesforce, of great cloud stuff. everybody's doing all this stuff. Yeah. Why are you choosing to build your own? And yeah. the answer for these large enterprises was essentially look, on prem world was actually great for some things because we could pay all those consultants to come in and build exactly what we wanted. And when Very you've got- customized, when on you've premises. Ten, yeah, totally customized, on-prem. And when you've got 10,000 contact center agents like we do, then you need to completely dial it in. Hmm. Because if I can shave 30 seconds off of every interaction, multiply by 10,000 agents every day, yeah, huge ROI, customer satisfaction goes up, all sorts of great things happen. Okay, fantastic. So what's wrong with that world? Well, let me tell you, once you do all that customization, you have this completely bespoke thing. Yeah. No one in the world has an installation of a contact center like ours. There's one person in the corner who knows how it all works. Let's make sure that person Super doesn't liability. die. Yeah, right? Like we're going to put that person in a bubble. Yeah. And, um, and then reliability starts to suffer. Like, oh, we're on the 17 yeah. versions ago because we can't touch it anymore. Yep. And so security Cruft. suffers. Technical reliability. Debt. And customers are telling us they get one nine reliability. One nine. Yeah. I mean, telco is supposed to be the land of five nines, right? This yeah. is one nine availability out of these solutions. And so while they love the customizability, operationally, they were just stuck. Yeah. And they could, and at some point you're like, don't, nobody touch it. Don't even breathe in the server room anymore yeah. because it seems to be working and they're just stuck. They have no roadmap. So does that mean you're moving up the software stack and you'll have more yeah. application level stuff? And so what we launched last year was a product called Flex. And it is a application platform mm -hmm. for the contact center, the world's first application platform for the contact center. And what it does is it delivers a contact center. Like, you know, you sign up and you get a contact center provisioned and it does the things you would expect a contact center to do, but it's not just an app that's done there. And if you want some feature, you got to, you know, yeah. earn the favor of the product manager, right? It is a platform. So the next step after you spin it up is developer, download the SDK and start customizing. Nice. And the developer can go in and add modules. Every layer of the stack is programmable. So you start them on second, third base. They just got to get the ball home. Yeah. And then they can take yeah. it in any direction they want. So for example, uh, Shopify mm. moved all their customer support over to Flex uh, last year. Mm. And they got started. They got a team of uh, three developers and two interns. And in three months, they went from the very first lines of code written to powering their global Isn't support. Isn't it amazing? Both of your companies, Toby's just... Shopify has gotten huge. He was on the podcast at the same time you were the first time, like in the 300s. And like, I went up to Canada to interview him and it's like this little tiny idea, like we're going to help mom and pop shops sell online. And now it's you know the juggernaut. that Toby and I have in common? What is it? We both started snowboarding companies in our past. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. He did a mail order snowboard company before Shopify. And he said, why wasn't this easier? You still bored? Uh, you go back I was to a skiing? horrible snowboarder. Oh, okay. I was. I did it like once a year for ten years, yeah. and by the end of like my one day, I'm like, oh, I think I remember how this works, and then I wouldn't get to go back out. And man, watch that year, toe side edge, man. Whew. Oh, right on your and the face. The first few the years, I started like 2004. Ooh. People didn't necessarily wear helmets as much back no, then. No, no, I did not wear helmets the first few. I would oh be a much God. smarter person. Twilio would have twice the probably market cap two, if I'd only worn you'd probably have a helmet. Two concussions. Hey, speaking uh, of concussions. Yeah. Uh, speaking of. For the entire existence of your company, people have said Twilio will die when Jeff Bezos points the AWS laser on you and decides to kill Twilio. And they've created competing products and you have surged and beaten in your category the mighty Amazon Web Services and the mighty Jeff Bezos. When we get back from this quick break, I want to know how you beat Amazon in your category on This Week in Startups. What is it that makes one startup work and another startup fail? This is something I ask myself all the time as an angel investor. Well, one of the things that all the companies that win big 
have in common is they understand their customers. They understand their customers deeply so that they can make better products and services for those customers to delight them and keep them from churning. You know this. And nothing will get you closer to your customers than Gain Site PX. Gain Site PX is the only all-in-one product experience platform, and it's built specifically for SaaS products, enterprise products. So if you're an enterprise founder, listen deeply. It provides the tools so you can understand your users deeply and study their behavior at both the individual level as well as at the account level. So you know at the company level and you know the people in the company. Maybe some people are gravitating towards one feature in your product and the other group of people don't even know it exists. That's data you need to know because that will reduce churn and maybe let you land and expand inside an enterprise. Well, this information is going to allow you to improve your product and keep your existing customers happy while gaining new ones. It's fully customizable. It's so scalable and no coding's required. You can do it yourself. Some of their best customers include Bongo, Bizaboo, Anaplan, Kenshu. You know these great companies. And here, take a look at the Gainsight PX platform if you're watching the video. You can see us now looking at all of the active users. Hey, it's up 36% in the past seven days. And then you can go into your navigation and do really interesting things, like maybe look at what is the path at which users are going through your product or service. Whoa, look, 17 people went to the next phase, 17% dropped off, you gotta know. And you can create a new NPS survey in the editor and pop that right on the website. So here's a great call to action. You can use Gainside PX for free right now, okay? What more do you need to know? It's free. Get in there, Gainsight, G-A-I-N-S-I-G-H-T dot com slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody, welcome back. The awesome Jeff Lawson is with us. If you want to hear his first two appearances, 308, 495 for those super fans out there. Acquired Senge Grid for $2 billion. Nicely done. Company went public back in 2016. You were first out. Weren't you like amongst the first out? We were. There have been no IPOs, uh, tech IPOs that year. In fact, I think Square had been the last one yeah. in like the, the fall of 2015. Yeah. And if you remember, there was a big like SaaS freak out in like yeah. February, and that's where like LinkedIn and yeah. you know ended up getting bought. And uh, yeah, it was sort of interesting. Like I always thought that like our reason for going public, yeah, um, was we are serving these critical mission critical communication workloads for companies of every variety. You know, we obviously have the startups, yeah. the Uber, the Lyft, the Airbnbs of the world, but also the enterprises mm. and. By going public, what I wanted to do is to create a bigger stage for the ah. company to execute on mm -hmm. and be able to then uh, f accelerate our uh, penetration into the bigger enterprises. Those big companies go, hey, this is a public company. It's legit. Yeah, they get x-ray vision. They can see into your books. They know that ah. you're, they know the health of the company. They can see Why the balance important? sheet. Because trust. Trust yeah. is the number one thing we're selling in every business that there is, but in particular in the cloud. Right. Think about what the cloud is. And I don't care if it's a SaaS application like Salesforce or infrastructure like AWS or communications like Twilio. The, what you're telling your customers, look, take this piece of your company hmm. and trust us with it and trust that we are going to move faster and execute better than you can do yourself if you build and do all the stuff internally. Yeah. And so I believe that no matter what your product actually is, the number one thing you're selling is trust. Hmm. And a great way to build trust is to be transparent but to also have the validation of the investor community, know that the audits and everything like that are like you are on the up and up. Yep. You're holding yourself to the highest bar. And that is a great way to build trust with your customers. Were you guys profitable when you were public or no. just break even? We were, uh, we had always maintained a good degree of financial discipline. Hmm. And we were, while we were money losing, obviously we raised about 240 million of venture capital before we went public. Yeah. We never went into the red in a crazy amount, right? We, we were investing had, in the business, right? Exactly. Like yeah. With a market as large as ours, we've always seen this as, uh, this is uh, an opportunity of a lifetime to hmm. transform one of the world's most, you know, largest and most important industries, communications. Yeah. And so that is something you invest in. Hmm. And so we've always invested, but we always kind of kept our eye. Like we could see profitability. It wasn't so far off right. that it wasn't crazy. And one of the other things that was interesting is that unlike some businesses that have to invest crazy amounts in sales and marketing yeah. to achieve growth, we were always a very efficient business because of our developer first approach. Right. We didn't have to pour ex tremendous amounts of money into go to market to grow the top line. We've been able to grow the top line but do it very efficiently. It's part of that because the developer learns how to use Twilio. They leave their company, they go to the next one. 
they're talking to their manager or the team and they're like, you know, Twilio does this. I did it at my last company or here's three ideas of what we can do with Twilio. And they just bring it with them. So now you've infected the next company because that person with the Twilio skill set went to the next one. There's a bit of that, but even at the company they're at today, right? When a developer finds out about Twilio, oftentimes the first thing a developer might build with Twilio, you know, they hear about Twilio, they sign up, and the first thing they might do is like prank call their brother-in-law. <laughs> like Rick roll someone, right? You're yeah. like, okay, great. Like, technically against your terms of service, but okay, whatever. Yeah. Um, this is the first thing they might do. But then they're like, okay, I get it. I know how this works. Um, then they're in the at work, maybe the next day, maybe a month later, maybe a, a year later. And someone's like, God, you know, it'd be amazing is if we could engage our customers and let them, you know, can we text them when this thing happens or let them text with us? We're going to have a conversation. Yeah. And the developer in the room is now able to say, oh, you know what? I know how to do that. Mm. It's Twilio. And they pick up Twilio and they build that prototype and they might do it in an afternoon. And they come into the meeting the next day. Hey, remember that idea we were talking about? Well, check out. I built this prototype yesterday. Let me yeah. know what you think. And you've just replaced a like, you know what, in the traditional world of enterprise software, might have been a year-long sales cycle, you know, going and getting budget, issuing an RFP, having, you know, 10 salespeople from 10 competing vendors come in and do a song and dance, pick a vendor, sign a contract, go professional services. You, re you just replaced all that stuff with an afternoon of a developer saying, I wonder yeah. if this is possible and getting, all, and getting out of the done. way. Getting out of the way. Yeah. But then the developer is the one who brings us in. So when they build that prototype and the business starts to see, oh, wow, look at what's possible. Look at what the developer did in an afternoon. If she was able to do that in an afternoon, imagine what she could do in a week or a month or a year. Right. And so that gets the ball rolling mm -hmm. where customers contact us and say, you know, for some customers, that's all they want. They're going to launch and that's fine. But for a lot of customers, especially in the enterprise, that will start the conversation with our sales team. But instead of having to be a you know, hard sell, yeah. no. um, you're Bottom taking yeah. the momentum the developer created and accelerating it and ushering it through to yeah. success. You got a champion internally. And then yeah. we've got, because we're a platform that can do many things, we can then say, oh, what are the other areas of communications where you want to engage with your customers? Yeah. What other challenges are you seeing? And we can come in and we can start addressing those. And so usually the first use case of, that a company deploys Twilio to solve is just the beginning. And we get to go sell the next and the next and the next. And so we've got this dollar-based net expansion rate, yeah. which uh, last quarter was 140%. So Dollar-based expansion. So this is what the current customers, how they expand. So if they spent a dollar last year, how much they spend this year? In aggregate. So in aggregate. net of churn. Right, so yeah. including churn, like most companies, you know, historically that would have been a negative number because sure. some of your customers yeah. churn. For us, the customers who spent $100 a year ago today in aggregate are spending $140. So even if you lost a couple of people, you have that net negative churn, I guess is the yep. industry term. And they, yep, and they, they made up for it, right? All right, back to the Amazon question. Over and over again, you heard, I heard, pundits, yada, yada. Twilio's toast, Amazon can make this in an afternoon and just destroy them. Well, Amazon did make competing products. And you guys have just continued to grow. Why? What happened? Why didn't they kill you? Well, first of all, we have a great relationship with Amazon, right? Okay. So we partnered with them and we help power a lot of those products. Huh. Uh, and they were an investor in Twilio uh, mm -hmm. in our last uh, private round. So, oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Ah. Um, and Bezos so, or Amazon itself? Amazon. Does that come with like, we're not going to compete with you or it just no. comes with a little bit of like friendship? It comes with a, uh, you know, it's a relationship. Got it. And, you know, having worked at AWS in the early days and, yeah. you know, knowing Andy and the team, uh, you know, I feel like we've always had a great relationship. But that aside, business is business, right? Yeah, got to compete. And so the way I think about it is that here's the classic blunder that I think some companies make when they fear or when Amazon does enter their domain. And by the way, if you have an interesting enough business in a large enough market, you should expect that even if it's not Amazon, somebody big and scary is going to enter your domain. Of course. And here's the classic mistake. Think about Amazon's playbook. What does Amazon do? They always focus on the customer. And, you know, famously, the culture at Amazon is about focusing on the customer and their needs, right? And so what happens to a lot of companies when Amazon enters your space? What is the What does that startup focus on? Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. And you have board meetings. What's our Amazon strategy? How's yeah. our, what's the, the strategy to defeat Amazon? And yeah. all anyone talks about is Amazon. Meanwhile, Amazon's sitting there talking about your customers. Yeah. Who's going to win? Exactly. Right? And so my advice to anyone, if like, you know, you worry about Amazon or Amazon has entered your space, like, and this goes not just Amazon, but any company, well, the answer is right in front of you, your customers. Yeah. Just focus on your customers, serving your customers better and faster with the things that they need from you. And if you do that better than any other company, you're fine. You should win. Yeah. And here's the thing to remember. 
any company, whether it's Amazon or Google or Facebook or just pick the scary company in your domain, whatever it might be, it's just made of people. Hmm. We're all people. I'm a person. Jason, you're a person. Every yeah. listener, you're a person. And we're all building companies. And every one of our companies is prone to success when we have great people hmm. uh, or it's prone to failure if we have bad people or we make, make bad decisions. And just remember that even though there's like a big, scary, like corporate logo hmm. that you might read a lot of stories about this company, yep. behind that logo is people. Hmm. And you are competing against the people behind that corporate logo for who's going to better serve the customer mm. and who's going to listen to customers and who's going to build faster and who's going to serve them better and make customers more successful. And it's, there may be a scary like trillion dollar corporate logo yeah. behind that thing. But at the end of the day, it's ask yourself, do I think that they, wh whoever the team is inside that big company that is like competing for, for my customers, do I think they're better than I am? Mm. And if the answer is yes, well, maybe you should go join them or go find another business. But yeah. probably when you look inside yourself, you'd be like, no, yeah. I'm better. You of know, course. I'm better. My team is better. Our ideas are better. We're here to do this. We're here to serve our customers and we are smart and we are motivated and we're going to get this done. That's essentially, that's the reality of life. Yeah. It's interesting. People get really scared by these big names. You have to remember, it's like you, your business is one of 500 things they're contending with, right? Like Amazon's got a lot on their plate. Yeah, and you teed up the question like Jeff Bezos is going to like say, yeah. Twilio, yeah. you know, no, wake Bezos up one day. Jeff Bezos is like shopping for new bathing suits because he's only got one apparently. I don't, did you see that story? You know what? They're I just really like, Jeff don't... Bezos has one bathing suit. It's got become like national news. I don't keep up on his undergarment situation. Did you work with him when you were there? I had some interactions with him. What is he like? Uh, he what is... What makes him so special? I would just, you know, I had some interactions. I would say he's focused. Mm. Um, he tends to be right a lot, which mm. actually became one of the values of Amazon, which I think is so funny because it's like, how do you make a value being right? It's either you are or you are, but you can't yeah. say, oh yeah, I was going to be wrong, but I remembered our value. Is to and, be right. <laughs> so I'm going to be right now. But um, but he does. He has this knack for being right, yeah. um, which is great. And then he helps train the people around him. And wh what I think about you know, more than, than Jeff is the system, the values of Amazon. Mm. Uh, when you look at the leadership principles that they have, it's really a playbook mm. for how to think and act like Jeff does. Yeah. So if you want a window into Jeff, just read those, those, those yeah. principles. That really is Jeff saying, here's to the, to, the, to the best I can figure out, here is what I do that tends to help me make good decisions and build a great business. And here's this playbook and I'm handing it to all of you, all the people at Amazon. And by the way, it's not private. It's, it's public on their website. He's handing it to the world yeah. saying, this is what it means yeah. to focus on customers and to be focused and to make hard decisions and to live with them and read his shareholder letters. Yeah, they're great. You know, there's, there's amazing tidbits. That's why I always thought so. it was like so weird. Did you read that? story about uh, like in the New York Times are like it's so horrible to work at Amazon and they had like all these people who quit and hated it and it's like do you realize that people who work at Amazon are some of like the most loyal like insane like high performance people like of course it's not for everybody that culture accountability is critically important for your startup you have to assign tasks, you have to assign projects, you've got all different phases of things you're trying to deploy at your startup. And Monday.com is going to allow you to do this. It's beyond just task management. You create boards, you can do your own or you can do it from a template. And it's really popular with non-tech teams as well as tech ones. And it replaces all these burdensome Excel files where you're putting checklists and punch lists in Excel and then, or maybe in a Google sheet and you're trying to make that work. No, you want to use monday.com. And Ben Seidel, who's been on the program and is in our portfolio from Neighborly, he uses it to plan the build outs of the new venues that he's creating at Neighborly. And he can assign accountability. And if people don't get something done, you know who's responsible. So you can go have that little chit chat and do a walk and talk. Pete Davis from Ampchar, another one of our high growth car, uh, startups. He went through our incubators from Sydney. He uses it for the growth marketing project management he's doing. You do growth marketing. You know how much work that is. Well, here's how easy it is. Here's my CMO fresh creating a board. Uh, and he's doing this for open office hours, which you guys have been experiencing when I uh, do open office hours. And he's assigning tasks. He's setting up a type form integration. They have all those great integrations. So you can see all the status of the founders and their biggest challenges coming into that monday.com board. He's going to make the board public. And we're going to do this ourselves here. We're going to have a public board where you can see the topics that are going to be discussed. Go see it right now. Officehours.launch.co slash 
August. I want you to start a 14-day free trial by going to monday.com, the day of the week, monday.com, what a great domain name, slash twist. That's monday.com slash twist. And use the promo code twist when you're ready to buy and you'll get 10% off a paid account. Thank you for that, Monday. Great product, great software. I met the team the other day. Wow, really impressive progress. Uh, And everybody go ahead and try it. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. How has the culture changed in your company? How many people do you have now? We're uh, almost 3,000 people. 3,000. You had three people 10 years ago. What, how did your job change having to get 3,000 people to work towards a common goal besides, you know, 330, 300? I mean, we could all imagine how to manage three and 30 people. 300, there's some techniques. 3,000 is a whole different ball of wax, isn't it? What I find is that as a startup CEO going through hypergrowth, you just have to accept the fact that your job mm. is to serve the needs of the company. And those needs are going to change as the company grows. And Mm. they're going to change quickly. Mm. And so for me, I would say every 9 to 12 months over the last 11 years, I've had to say, hmm, what's my job now? Mm. Because it seems to have changed. Because the things I was doing a year ago to lead this company don't feel like they're working anymore. Ah. And so you start to see these things. And it's natural to get really frustrated Mm. and to say, Oh, God, you know, people aren't listening or God, mm-hmm. I've said this before. How come I have to say it again? Yeah. Or, you know, how, whatever it is, but you know, you can get angry. You can get angry at, at, you know, the fact that your company is growing. You can get angry at gravity for being there. Right. Or yeah. you can say like, well, that's just a fact. Right. And therefore I have to evolve and continually change the way I lead in order to serve the needs of a much larger uh, company. What's the number one thing you've had to change personally as the leader of 330, 300 and now? Three thousand. It's changed. It's just certain Optimize, things get more refine. important, right? First okay. of all, you always have to hold yourself to the highest leadership standard, because hmm. I find that companies become a reflection of the leaders. One hundred. And in particular, if you're a founder, CEO, you're the most obvious and apparent leader in the company. Hmm. That the company reflects your actions, your yeah. behaviors, your thought processes. Like it or not, like the company becomes an amplification of both your best. Uh, best features and your worst features. Your bugs and your features. Right? And so be prepared for that and then say, okay, great. How do I focus on presenting my best features and making them better? And how do I prevent the things that I don't like? Yeah, fixing your bugs. Fix your bugs, right? And uh, you know, I feel incredibly privileged to have worked with a coach as I Ah. built Twilio, a guy named Jerry Colonna. And what's nice- Oh, Jerry's your coach? Jerry Jerry was just on the podcast. I Jerry hired me to be an analyst for him for $1,000 a month with Acme Ventures, which was the precursor to Union Square Ventures, which was the precursor to Flatiron. And he was just on the podcast for the new book reboot, which is incredible. Well, that's what I was going to say, which is everybody can now, for the cost of about $12 or whatever- Read the book. Read the book. And Jerry is fantastic in the sense that like, it is easy. Two books I'll I'll give that I really loved on this management concept. I mean, there's so many books, but- Jerry's book just came out, Reboot. Reboot, amazing. Um, and then personal. the other one is Danny Meyer's book, Setting the Table. Really? I haven't read it. Yes, Union so Square Cafe, Shake Shack, famous New York chef, right? I think yep, I got famous New York chef, uh, Shake Shack, Union Square Cafe. All, He's the yeah. guy who included the service fee and get the back of the house to share in the service fee. Very uh, iconoclastic, mm-hmm. strong beliefs. What did but you learn a, from that a, book? A, but a beautiful human being. Like He is just uh, one of the most thoughtful, menschy people uh, that mm. I've had the privilege of getting to know in the course of building oh, Twilio. Really? And the book is fascinating, right? He talks about this notion of, you know, when you start your restaurant, you want everything to be perfect. Yep. And so the you, you put the salt shaker in the middle of the table, yep. right? In the perfect middle of the table, because that's where it's supposed to be. And you train your staff, you know, all the, mm-hmm. the service people, like, you want to be, put it right in the middle of the table. And then what happens? Is like, you know, Drift. someone's setting the table and it moves off center of the table. Drift. And there's a natural tendency, especially for an entrepreneur, to get mad. Why is it off table? I told you to put it in the middle. And and he's like, but the thing to do is to just show people, just put it back in the middle of the table. And with mm. your leadership example, show how it's supposed to be. Yeah. And every time it moves off center, what do you do? You move it back. Show, don't tell. And here's the reason. The reason is you can get angry at that thing and say, well, it's not supposed to be that way. But mm. you have to recognize that the order of the universe is to move that salt shaker off the middle of the table. Mm. 
That's what the universe does. It creates yeah. disorder. It creates chaos. The universe is there to do that. And you can get angry at the universe. Yeah. Or you can accept that and keep correcting it and, and bend, uh, you know, essentially bend the behaviors towards what, what you want. Right. But getting angry at the universe, getting angry at essentially the natural order of things. Like I, I liken it to, am I going to get angry at gravity or am I going to accept that yeah, it exists? It exists. And then and yeah. then work around it. That to me is essentially the essence of, of leadership in a complex and demanding environment. It's yeah. like, you need to take all these things that are going to happen to your business, mm. right? And figure out how do I lead with grace and humility mm. and empower the people around me to yeah. themselves deal with the salt shaker getting moved for whatever yeah. their salt shaker is and their yeah. part of the job and try to teach people, here's what we're here to do and do that all in the purpose of a mission your company is on. Mm. And so what your job as the CEO at the end of the day is to set that vision and that mission and continually re-articulate it. I am repeat always it. surprised repeat it. Um, at how often you need to repeat yourself. And that is, that's the job. That's what yeah. you're there to do. And then the second thing, assuming you want to achieve it, you need to keep on repeating it. Um, and the second thing you need to do is to show people by your actions mm -hmm. and by the values of your company how to go achieve that mm -hmm. and how what is the path we're going to take to get there. How are we going to get there and get there intact and get mm -hmm. there as a greater group of human beings than we started with? And what is the way that we're going to do that? Because along the way, you're going to achieve obstacles. You're going to have to jig and jag and find ways around obstacles. And it's going to be hard. And people are going to be upset and angry. Yeah. And like all sorts of emotions come out in this whole thing. Yeah. And so how do you as a company address those? How do you as yeah. leaders address those things? Mm -hmm. And how do you react to uh, those situations? That's to me is what makes or breaks the company and its values and the probability of you actually achieving the mission that you're on. Yeah, And I've uh, sort of internalized with Jerry's help uh, and others that I think that is the most important thing. And sure, there's stuff we do in the day to day. Like, sure, Tactical. I, gotta, I gotta check my email. Sure, I gotta yeah. make sure. Certain, I gotta make sure. You know, in the early days, okay, the bills have to get paid, and the yeah, also, and the customers. But as long as I, the most important thing, and over the longer time frame that you do, is set that compelling vision and mission the company is on, and get people to want to follow you right on that mission. And number two, set the tone for how is it we're going to go achieve that mission. Right. And that's with your own behavior. Your own leadership. What is your tone? You put out? What is your tone? You know, I, your leaders different. Are you intense? Are you focused? Are you kind? What is your tone? What I generally try to do is bring um, energy ah. towards all of those interactions. Because, like, look, building a business is hard. Yeah. And it's easy to get down. It's easy to get frustrated. It's tired. easy to get tired. But and if your leaders look tired, oh, it's bad. Your leader, you right. Yeah, they're exhausted. I'm not going to pick up the rifle if they're not picking up the rifle. <laughs> right. You yeah. got to come in with the rifle up. Yeah. So number one thing that I think about is I just need to approach these situations with the excitement that I have for this opportunity mm. and the energy for whatever the, the situation we're in is. Yeah. And a fundamental belief in the human capacity to overcome whatever the adversity is or whatever yeah. the situation is, whatever hill we need to take, whatever uh, thing we're trying to get done. I fundamentally believe in the human ability to do that. Yeah. And if I come in with that energy, then, uh, and that's what I present to my team, then that will give them the energy mm. in order to do the same. And that is how I believe. Now look, it's, yeah. sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you actually are tired. Sometimes, yeah. right? And so the other thing I would say yeah. is I take very visible vacations. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. So you first of all- You make it clear all, to people, I'm taking two weeks off. Take care of yourself. Yeah. Take vacations. Any business worth building is not a sprint. It's the marathon, whatever. Yep. You know, pick your analogy. Might be some sprints in there, but it's a marathon. Sure. Yeah. yeah. We just had our big customer conference. That feels like a sprint. Oh, but you man. Know what? That thing got huge. This is a marathon. Yeah. yeah. Our first year in Moscone Center. That was really exciting. Oh, my God. That's an arm and a leg. Oof. You yeah, must have a big a budget huge. now. Our, our, the team did an absolutely amazing job. How many people came to that? What do you call it? Twilio? Uh... Uh, Signal. Signal, right. Signal's yeah. name of our conference. We had over 4,000 yeah. attendees. 4,000. Wow. Yeah, much bigger than last year, despite the fact that we had it, we did it in August, which was. Uh, well, that's probably the only dates of Alva from Moscone. I went and negotiated are, with them. They're like 8,000 hotel rooms, this, that, the other thing. It was so hard to it's negotiate. It's tough to get in there. And when you your first year in, they're like, you're the lowest, you know, yeah. you're on the lowest. No, I know. Here. They're like, Steve Jobs has been here before. Yeah, they tell Steve me the gets Steve Jobs date stories. He wants, but. Uh, they you... built bathrooms for Steve Jobs. Really? When he went and he would do the things there, he'd be like, I want these bathrooms and that my people are going to come in and build these bathrooms for me. And they're like, bring in like bathrooms, whatever. It was like crazy stories like that. All right, listen, you got to wrap I, up. You I, got a lot I of, didn't do that. You didn't do that. You're not that crazy. Let me ask you a personal question. Uh, when we met, you were doing okay. You're a billionaire now. 
How can, do you not I, let that? Before we talk about yeah. that um, uncomfortable topic, yeah, uh, I want to finish. It is uncomfortable. I want to finish that's what I though. Ask you about. That's why you're going to ask. That's yeah. why you've got a following that you do. Yeah, because you ask the, the the hard questions. Take vacations. Take I want to finish that thought. Yes, but also let your teams know that you do. Right. And when I come back from vacation, I announce we have all hands every month. I come back. I say, I just took an amazing two week vacation. I unplugged. Uh, first of all, thank you to my amazing team. So Everybody smart. here that lets me do it. And by the way, all of you, take care of yourself. Remember to take your vacations. Show, and you show them. Yep. You don't just tell them to take the vacation. You show them you take and the vacation. And I show them. And I and I show appreciation for the team. And yeah. I think that is one of the key things to actually being able to have longevity. Uh, the other thing is, and I didn't do this until about a couple of years ago, uh, physical health. Mm. I, gotta, I, you know, I go you to a gym. You lost a little weight. Look right at you. You're looking street. good. Thank you very much, Jason. Are you lifting? You're biking? What are you doing? You Pelotoning? Uh, uh, I ride outside. Nice. I like to run now. You, how many pounds did you lose? I, about 50 pounds. You look I used great. to say I love- When you walked in, I was like, whoa, it's noticeable in your face. Thank you, Jason. Your I energy level it. goes up, right? Energy level goes up. But taking care- I wasn't taking good care of myself. I'll take good yeah. care of yourself. Yeah. And uh, and the amount of energy you'll sleep, have, the amount of excitement. Yeah, get some out, sleep, right? Drink like all juices. those things, especially in the early days of a startup, you're like, who has time for working out or sleeping or yeah. drinking juices? You're like, ah, work, 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 work. And like, look, I won't lie to you. The early days of a startup, lots of hard work. And you yeah. can sit here and say, sure, Jeff, easy for you to say. You now. Know, yeah, now. Yeah, now. Yeah, and like you weren't doing that when you were a smaller yeah. company. But I'll say I know plenty of entrepreneurs who have made taking care of themselves a critical part, like, you know, like like physically Physical. getting to the gym. Mental like, health. I didn't do it. Mental health. Um, in the early days of their startup and they are incredibly successful. Yeah. And so no matter what you think is more important than being physically healthy and mentally healthy, yeah. guess what? I doubt it is. Yeah. All right. How has this messed with your brain at all? How do you contend when you talk to Jerry? It is a bird in great wealth. Do you think about it sometimes? You, you know, we get on this train and all of a sudden something hits, like it hit for me with Uber, right? And all of a sudden you have this like big check comes in and change your life a little bit. How have you dealt with it? Because you're doing it on a really big scale now. Are you distracted by the money? Being a billionaire, it makes you obviously uncomfortable for me to even say it to you. I can see the look on your face when I say, Jeff, you're a billionaire now. You got the B next to your name. How do you- Now you're just going to keep going. All right. No, so I, how, I gotta see, rise. how do you manage it? Like, it, 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 you know, because a lot of people- screw a little I have bit. a lot of friends who don't manage it well or had like a lot of- Listen, I have friends who flipped the car. Let's put it that way. You know, they kind of really made them weird. They had to go to therapy and figure it out. You seem like you've adjusted really well to this, you know, level of privilege, wealth. And and let's face it, it's it's a responsibility in our society to be in this position. How have you dealt with it? I would you say, think about you know, it? first thing first is remember that like for a, a company founder who has a lot of equity, right, it's... It's paper wealth. Okay. So keep Fair that enough. in mind. Yeah. Right? Keep things in perspective. Like nothing is guaranteed. Yep. And I was like, every time Tulia would reach milestones where like, you know, we would like raise mm -hmm. around a financing and so our paper value got higher, whatever it is, I would always remind myself and the company like, hey, look, we're just, we're just getting started. Do nothing is guaranteed. This could all go sour tomorrow. So remember that and focus on what we need to do as far as our customers, mm. their success and the company's success. And if we keep doing that, you know, maybe some of that paper wealth turns into actual wealth yeah. one day, but like, don't take that for granted. So that's the first thing that I would yeah. say. And even for me, like most of, um, most of what I have is in Twilio stock, Yeah, which is, uh, it's fantastic that the market has treated us so well, but at the same time, I can't take it for granted and say, yeah. you know, peace out, right? Yep. I got to build a company here. Yeah. Um, but the second thing and the more important thing I would say is no matter what your level of uh, fortune is in the world, is having a responsibility to the world around us mm -hmm. and the greater society around us and the communities that we operate in. And just remember, like we've had the privilege of building these companies yep. because of the amazing society that we have. Yes. Democracy. Democracy. Capitalism. Capitalism. Voting, but even just, yeah. but also recognize that you can't take those things for granted. And Obviously by the we way, cannot. many people around us don't have those things. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, uh, investing in the community around you, whether it is the people, like homelessness is a big issue in San Francisco. It's crazy. Whether it's investing in the democracy and making sure representative democracy continues to work. That would be or, good. Or uh, investing in other areas. I believe that it's our job as our companies and as ourselves to recognize the privilege that we have entering this life of entrepreneurship and building yeah. a company and giving back and making sure the world is better for more people around us and for the next generation of entrepreneurs. Yeah. How do we leave the world better than we found it? Yeah. And so, you know, the only thing that I would say is, is a, a material difference 
um, after having been marked as a billionaire yeah. is that uh, my wife and I were able to take the giving pledge. Oh, and so we fantastic. committed to giving yeah. half of our wealth. Uh, that's technically the commitment, although our intention is least, to do yeah, more do than more, that. Uh, of course. Um, whatever our wealth ends up being in our lifetime, we <laughs> commit to giving almost all of it away uh, in the interest of using our good fortunes on this planet to help bring more good fortune, more opportunity to the people of the world around us. All right. Listen, Jeff, you said it all uh, and you said it well. Congratulations on the tremendous success. It's been great getting to know you over the years, and thanks for coming on the pod uh, so consistently. A lot of sometimes people hit the, uh, you know, they get the escape velocity. I don't hear from them again, but you come back on the pod and you share it, and you're so candid. Uh, if you are a developer or uh, looking for a great job, no better place to work, no better boss to have than Jeff Lawson. Go to their jobs page and uh, go join the team there. It's still day one at Twilio. All right, we'll see you all next time on this week's service. Bye bye. <laughs>